All right, how's everybody tonight? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 16 and 17, one of the most uh, challenging yet incredibly uplifting passages you'll find in Jeremiah. So I'm not sure which one you're going to like, the challenging part or the encouraging part. Uh, but nonetheless, you get both. You get both today. How to survive in a spiritual decline. How to survive in a spiritual decline. When there is a spiritual recession, as it were, in all around us, when that is happening, what do you do? How do you survive that part? How do you deal with spiritual decline all around you and not have it affect you? How not to have it affect you? So Jeremiah will teach us more tonight about that, how to deal with a spiritual decline, whether it's in the nation, whether it's in the church, and um, how to deal with it. Because we could survive it, Jeremiah did, and he actually prospered in a spiritual decline in Israel at this time. I do believe that uh, we are living in a spiritual battle in our nation. Uh, reminds us a lot of what happened to Israel. Remember Israel? Uh, broken promises. One thing you can say about the Jewish people in the Old Testament. They had the law. They had the word of God. They had the promises. They had the covenants. Because the old, even the new covenants in the Old Testament. And broken promises. They did not fulfill the word of God. They were unfaithful to the covenant. Now, of course, when we see the Jewish people, uh, as it were, both Old and New Testament, we see the church as well, the people of God. Both Old and New Testament would include the Jewish people and the church as well. So when we see the difficulties of Israel in the Old Testament, we have to always see the church. We have to see the church, as it were, through those lenses. So we see those lenses. It has a um, bifocals, right? You have the bifocals? I have them. Uh, sort of transitional with no line, but sometimes I used to have the line. And, you know, you look down a little bit and, uh, you know, you can see further and you can see close. And um, when you see close, you see Israel. And then you look up a little further out, you see the church. And so that's what you have here today is when we see Israel, we see the church. Paul the Apostle told us that, didn't he? He says all these things were written in the Old Testament uh, for our lesson, our learning, our encouragement, that we may have hope and not to repeat the same sins that they committed. So what was going on at the time of Jeremiah? Of course, he's in Jerusalem, and time was running out. Now, we guys have been through this already, so don't want to delay any uh, preambles, but uh, time was running out for what? What was coming? Anybody know what was coming to, Israel, to Judah, to the kingdom of Judah? Yeah, exactly. Judgment was coming. The exile was coming. God has said that Babylon was coming from the north. So this is the background to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is living at a time where a steep spiritual decline among God's people. Steep. And, and I do believe as a nation today, we are living in a spiritual crisis as a nation. Spiritual crisis is a, a spiritual battle in our nation. We see it in different forms. We see it in society. We see it in how it looks in uh, media and society and politics and social things. But it's really behind the scenes. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. The forces of darkness are up against God's people. And, um, you know, sometimes they may dress themselves as angels of light. So I'm not saying it's just because it looks spooky. That's, okay, has to be the enemy. The enemy can come as an angel of light. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of quote-unquote good in our nation that people are trying to do good. That's not God. Just because it starts with G doesn't mean it's God. It might be good, but it's good without God, it's, which is part of the strategy of the enemy, right? But Satan wants us to keep us from this book. This is his strategy, is to keep us from this, uh, this book, this word. And because um, the thing that hates, uh, Satan hates the most, the thing that Satan hates the most is truth. It's truth. If he can hate the truth and get us to be less confident in the truth, then uh, he has us right where he wants him. He wants us. So pray that the enemy doesn't distract us. Pray that the enemy doesn't distract you and I from this book and from each other. Because that's the unity that God wants in us is the unity in his word, unity in the truth. So may the Lord give us strength to stand together in these difficult times as a nation, right? Because it, um, things will continue to become more challenging. We're two months away from 2022. I don't know where 2021 went, but uh, somehow it uh, slipped through the fingers. It's like time is like water, right? You, you put your hands out or like in the air, you try to catch it and try to hold on to it, and it just seems to slip on by. But the prophet Jeremiah had a message for the people. This is his message. In a time of spiritual decline, uh, Jeremiah spoke like many other prophets, 
See, many of the prophets did not have a, a brand new message. Sometimes they did. But Jeremiah was from the town called Anatoth. Anatoth, we learned that in chapter 1. And Anatoth was a, a place where the priests lived. And so he lived in a priestly town, in a priestly home. So he knew his Bible. So when we read tonight, chapter 16 and 17, it will remind you uh, this passage right here. Cursed is the man who, doesn't tr uh, who trusts in man, who draws strength from man. The person that trusts in the Lord will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Sounds like Psalm 1, exactly like Psalm 1. And you would say, yes, it's the comparison of the man who trusts the Lord and the man who trusts in man. The man who trusts in the Lord and the man who trusts in man. It will be a blessing and a curse. And so, yes, it does sound like Psalm 1 because it, he got it from Psalm 1. But he puts it in the context of his time. So Jeremiah is a man who knew his Bible. He knew the Torah and he knew the Psalms. And one key verse for tonight that we want to see is turn to chapter 17. Turn to chapter 17 and verse 13. This is the key, believe, I believe, for these two chapters. It would be this passage here. O oh Lord, hope of Israel. By the way, we're looking at both chapters tonight. We might not finish chapter 17, but we'll get to the crucial part, and we'll leave, that at, uh, we'll leave the end for the next time. O oh Lord, the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from the earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water, even the Lord. Forsaken the fountain of living water. The Lord is the fountain of living water. And we had to go back even to Jeremiah chapter 2 when, they, when he told them that there were two evils that they had done. They had committed two evils. They forsaken the fountain of living water, which was the Lord. The fountain of living water is a source of all water. And they had made for themselves cisterns. Cisterns. There are these big cisterns you can put on the ground in Israel at the time. This is before Jesus came, and they, they hewn them out. They dug them out, and they, it was sort of where they put the water in. And um, if they weren't careful, those cisterns would have cracks. And the water, as much water you put in, as much water would get out. So you'd think, oh, we're going to store all this water. We made cisterns, Israel said, and they can hold no water. And they forsook the Lord. He's the one that gave the water. And so I think this is the key passage here to understand both chapters is they forsook the Lord. Now, when did this take place? Well, when you read Jeremiah, he, he prophesied during a time of many kings, many, many kings. And one of the kings was Josiah, the first one that he, um, that he grew up with. He was actually really, uh, close in age to Josiah. But this chapter takes place at the time of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. This is around the year 600 um, AD, or sorry, BC. And this is the time, 600 years about before Jesus even came to this world, before Jesus came to Judah, came to Israel. So we're dealing with the period of time of about 31 years where Jehoiakim was the king. The wickedness of Jehoiakim was terrible. He was a king that was, of course, into idolatry, immorality, vice, abuse, child sacrifice, the burning of children to Molech. This is the child sacrifice that was around the time of Jeremiah, time of Jehoiakim. And the wickedness was so dark, it just got darker and darker and darker. And guess what? That wasn't the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the people loved it. The people loved it. They wanted no change in society. They wanted to keep it just the way it was because things were just enough. Things were just good enough economically, and things were getting, uh, they hoped uh, things were getting better, but they weren't getting better. The people loved it. And so Jeremiah prays, and that's what we've been studying. He prays, and he prays constantly. Uh, you've seen the prayers, right? You've heard the prayers. You've read them with me. Um, anybody have any thoughts on Jeremiah's prayers? There's a lot of them, by the way. We read every chapter, and, that, and today is no different. There's going to be a lot of prayers. The prayers of Jeremiah. Anybody have any uh, thoughts on the prayers of Jeremiah? Maybe comments or complaints about the prayers of Jeremiah? No one? Okay. I'll tell you one thing. He prayed constantly. I'll tell you one thing. He prayed tearfully. When was the last time we prayed and you cried? Right? Uh, he prayed with intensity. Right? It wasn't just, uh, Lord, lay me down, my soul to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That wasn't his prayer. It was intense. It was tearful. It was impactful. And it got to the point where 
Even God told them, Jeremiah, I'm not going to listen to your prayers anymore. Even if you were stand there and prayed, it's not going to change anything. Babylon is coming. The exile is inevitable, and the invasion is going to happen. The temple, the city will be destroyed, and they're going to go into exile, and they're going to weep. The people are going to weep until they weep all of their idolatry out of their system. Literally is what God was saying. They're going to go into exile, and Judah is going to weep in exile until all of their idolatry and immorality is out of them. And boy, did they weep in the exile. And it was tearful, and it was difficult. And people were falling left and right spiritually. They, uh, a spiritual decline, very steep, the time of Jeremiah. But one thing you know, Jeremiah was not in decline Jeremiah was actually growing stronger. There was a collapse in society, and Jeremiah was not collapsing. Their standards were gone, but Jeremiah stood firm. So it tells you something, that no matter what's going on around you, it could actually prosper you and spiritually prosper you. In a time of decline, you can prosper in the Lord in such a way that even when the standards are gone, you can remain firm because Jeremiah stood firm. And this is what we're going to see today. And so uh, I, I think of our society. I think of uh, what's happening in Israel at the time of Jeremiah. And I think of the choices God gives us. You know, I'm thinking, what kind of society does God want for us? What kind of society does God want for us? And what kind of society do we want? Not just as Christians, but maybe as Americans. What kind of society do we want to see? And, uh, you know, Judah wanted a society. But they wanted a society with no repercussions of their choices. They wanted a society that they can do whatever they want. They can live without God and say, ah, it's all good. But then when the payment came, you know, because there's always a payment. When you decide to live in a society without God, there's a payment. Just people don't like the payment. People don't like the repercussions, right? When the price tag came and it was time to pay the piper because of what they had done in society. Oh, no, we don't want it. We don't want that. Well, they had built themselves a society without God, and they left God out of the picture. And so Jeremiah comes and he preaches, just like the Old Testament prophets, just like Moses. God gives you two choices. There's roads here. There's blessings and there's curses. You'll see it today. You know, Jesus spoke that way too. So it wasn't just Jeremiah. It was Jesus. Anybody think of Jesus giving people choices? No? All right, I'll tell you one. Uh, kind of quiet today. You guys are scaring me a little bit. All right? Yes. In Genesis, no, something Jesus said, something Jesus said, yeah, something Jesus said, right? He said, there's a narrow road, and there's a wide road. There's a narrow gate, and there's a wide gate, right? There is a rock that you can build on, or there's a sand that you can build on, right? There, is the, there are the wise virgins you can emulate, or there are the foolish virgins you could emulate, right? It always gave us choices. Moses was the same, right? There's the wheat and the tares, the chaff and the wheat. Constantly, Jesus was telling us there's two choices. And by the way, there's only two. We'll talk about third options because people want a third option, and there isn't really a third option. So we'll look at it this way. Chapter 16 and 17 deals with the kingdom, deals with individuals, and society. We probably don't get to the society one until maybe next time because it's really, it's like a sandwich, right? <laughs> the kingdom society, and in the middle is an individual. There wasn't much hope for the kingdom except the promises of God to restore them. Uh, there wasn't much hope for society. They had abandoned the Lord, but the, you know where the choice was? The individual. The individual had a choice, and that's what we're going to be talking about more today than anything because the kingdom had already, God had already decided. They're going into judgment. Society had already fallen. They're going into exile, but the individuals who listened to Jeremiah and put their trust in the Lord, they could be saved. They could be spared. And that's what Jeremiah was sent to preach to the individual, to the nation. Yes, bad news was going to come, but bad news was going to follow by good news. God was going to restore them. Not yet. It'll take some time. They would go into exile, but the individuals did not have to go in the same way the society went. So let's look at the first few verses of chapter 16. Because, uh, uh, by the way, chapter 16, the whole chapter, all the way to chapter 17, verse 4, is one section, and it's about the kingdom. And, oh, that kingdom was divided. And by the time, you know, of course, you guys remember David, the kingdom, the expansion through David, the expansion through Solomon, peace all around him. But by the time you got to Jeroboam and Rehoboam, as Frank's not here, but as Frank would say, they were both bums. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, right? They were both bums. They, um, 
Frank's not here. I miss him. Um, <laughs> the divided kingdom. It happened because of the two gen the general and the son of uh, Solomon, and they divided the nation. And by the time Israel went into exile with the Assyrian uh, invasion, there was only the tiny little kingdom of Judah. Two tribes from this kingdom to this. Wasn't much left of David's kingdom. Wasn't much left of Solomon's kingdom. And it was a tragedy. And part of chapter 16, actually all of chapter 16, all the way to verse 4, it's about the kingdom. It's about the land. And actually the, the word land appears over and over and over again here. Uh, the land, the land, the land, the land. And God has a lot to say about the land because the land is basically God's gift to Israel. Remember, it's, it's very important. Even to this day, we're still talking about the land, aren't we? The land of Israel, the tension in the, in the Middle East, you know, the, 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 the terrorism and what's happening in the land, Gaza. Palestinian, West Bank, Israel, what belongs to Israel, what doesn't belong to Israel. All that, all that land was promised by God to Israel as a nation. It says, you know, this is my land. I'm going to give you the land to take care of, to actually take care of it and to secure it. Uh, but if you don't follow my ways, I can kick you out of my land. And by the way, it's not just Israel. God is in charge of all the lands of the world. The earth is the Lord in all of its fullness. Paul says in, in Acts 17, you can read it on your own when you want to, God is actually the one that sets limits to the land, wherever nation, doesn't matter which nation it is, God sets the limits to those nations. It's God who sets the borders. It's God who's in charge of giving the land to individuals. Uh, as history shows us, you know, if, uh, if they're faithful to what God has shown that people, they will prosper. If they're unfaithful to what God has shown those, those people, that land, then those land, the land gets reduced and there's a fight and there's, there's uh, attrition in those lands. You can see it everywhere today in Africa, Azerbaijan with Armenia. All these tensions in, in the world about lands has to do with our people being faithful to what God is saying. And God sets the limit. And God gave that land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob after they came out of uh, Egypt. He told them, you will be prosperous. You will have peace if you follow my ways. And uh, don't go into idolatry. And unfortunately, they did not follow through. Right? They, they, um, after Egypt, after, um, after they came out of Egypt, they came into the land. They were unfaithful. And after the kingdom, the one was taken to Assyria. And we're going to see that the kingdom of Judah will go into Babylon. Let's read verse 1. Jeremiah is told something personally about himself that is really kind of distressful to a lot of people. But let's understand what Jeremiah was feeling like. The word of the Lord came to me, verse 1, chapter 16. You shall not take a wife for yourself, nor have sons and daughters. For thus says the Lord, concerning the sons and the daughters born in this place, concerning their mothers who bear them and their fathers who beget them in this land, they will die of deadly diseases. They will not be lamented or buried. They'll be as dung on the surface of the ground and come to an end by the sword, famine. Carcasses will come food for the birds of the sky, for the beasts of the earth, for the Lord for thus says the Lord, do not enter a house of the morning, or go and lament and console them. For I have withdrawn my peace from this place, declares the Lord, my loving kindness and compassion. Both great men and small will die in this land. They will not go be buried. They will not be lamented, nor will anyone gash himself or shave his head for them. Men will not break bread and mourning for them, to comfort them any more for the dead, nor give them a cup of consolation to drink for anyone's father or mother. Moreover, you shall not go into the house of feasting, to sit with them, or to eat, or to drink with them. Incredible stuff, isn't it? Jeremiah is told, Jeremiah, you're not going to get married. Why aren't you not going to get married, Jeremiah? Because uh, there's trouble coming into this land. There's trouble coming to this land, and um, you're not going to get married. You're not going to have children. And um, that must have been really tough for Jeremiah. He was probably in his late 20s, early 30s, maybe by this time. And it uh, must have been tough for him to hear that. Uh, it would have been really comforting, right, to have a wife dealing with the issues of ministry and the stress of ministry. I thank God for my wife. You know, you can talk to her about, I talk to her a lot of things, and, and sometimes it's not easy. And having somebody there, it makes all the difference in the world. But sometimes God says, you're not going to get married. Why? Jeremiah, society's gone. The society that you want and what you think it's going to be in that society, it's not there. Uh, in fact, uh, having children and having a wife could be very difficult in a society like this. People are going to go through tough times. And I think the hardest thing to do is, is to be involved emotionally 
you know, having family, knowing that they will suffer. God is sparing Jeremiah of any further suffering. This, this is the reality of it. Um, don't go to funerals, he says. Don't go to social activities. Don't go to parties. Uh, because sadness is coming. It's, it's coming to the land. And um, there's a point where having family could actually be more hurtful for the individual because it's one thing when you suffer yourself. You can deal with it. I know I think about it, and I'm like, well, if I had to go through it myself, it wouldn't be hard. It would be hard, but it would, you, you deal with it, right? Seeing your children suffering, seeing your wife suffering, seeing your husband suffering, it's a whole different ballgame, isn't it? And so God said, you're not going to get married, Jeremiah, because times are going to be very difficult. In fact, uh, didn't Jesus say something like this? Jesus said, uh, you know, there are eunuchs that have been made eunuchs by men. You know, it's been thrusted upon them. And there are eunuchs, people that don't get married, for the kingdom of God. What did Jesus mean by that? There are some eunuchs that have been made eunuchs by men. Okay, we know that. We know some, it could have been like Daniel, could have been somebody in the kingdom, uh, like in Persia or Babylon, who uh, were castrated by the kingdom, by the king, because uh, they were to only serve the king. Right? But when Jesus said there were some who by choice had been made eunuchs for the kingdom of God. Anybody have an idea of why Jesus said that? To serve the Lord. Yeah. Basically, they made a decision. Yeah, they made a decision not to engage in what normal activity would be. Socially, marriage, children, the normal, the normal state of a man. God wants us to do that. That's a normal state for humanity. But there's a time where Jesus said, because of the kingdom of God, because of the situation, some for the kingdom have chosen not to be married and have children because they could serve the Lord more effectively and could put up with things and go through stuff. I know missionaries who are not married that they suffer a lot. They suffer loss. They suffer hunger. They go through villages and different parts of the world, and they're not married. And if they had children, it would have been very, very difficult to go through with that. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says the same thing. I think it's chapter 7. He says, the pressures of this life will come to such a point in society that it would be easier to be a single person than to be married. Now, when somebody hears that, right, and they're like, oh, my goodness, here I go. It's not me. I'm not going to get married, right? Uh, but it's talking about God's calling in that individual's life, right, where the standards and difficulties of life, the sufferings, it's a lot easier to deal with it without children. This is what Jeremiah was dealing with. This is what Paul is talking about, that when you see your children suffer, it's a lot harder. And um, the, 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 the singles could say, well, if I have to suffer, I'll suffer myself. And God says, yeah, you probably bear more than seeing your wife or your children suffer. And this is Jeremiah's situation. For the sake of his ministry and his calling and what the time of the situation he was on, um, having children would have been a detriment at this point. Children are a blessing. They're from God, absolutely. In certain situations, in certain instances, it could actually hurt Jeremiah much more. It could affect his calling and ministry had he gone into that relationship and have children. And many times that happens to a lot of people, a lot of pastors, a lot of ministers. You know, they see the suffering of the world and they see their children suffering and it's tough. It's really tough. Here's Jeremiah. You're not going to go into that relationship. You're not going to have it uh, because it'll be a lot harder for you, Jeremiah, had you have, if you have a wife and if you have children. I can only imagine seeing my children suffer, what it would be like. Well, the Lord is sparing because the time is a very difficult time in Judah. Now let's jump to verse 10. If they ask you, Jeremiah, what's going on, you need to tell them that they forsook me. Now, when, the, when you tell this people all these words, they will say to you, for what reason has the Lord declared all this great calamity against us? You know, so the, the, the obvious question, right? Hey, if the Lord says this is going to happen, what's the reason? Right? They want to know. The uh, middle of verse 10. What is our iniquity? What is our sin which we have committed against the Lord our God? Not like they didn't know, right? But this is a natural response. Lord, what are you doing this to us? You know, we're your people. Verse 11. Then you're to say to them, Jeremiah, it is because of your forefathers have forsaken me, declares the Lord, and have followed other gods and served them and bowed down to them. But me, they have forsaken me, and they have not kept my word, my law. You too have done evil, even more than your forefathers. For behold, you are each one walking according to the stubbornness of his own evil heart without listening to me. So I will hurl you, hurl you out of this land into the land which you have not known, neither, know, neither you nor your fathers. Uh, and there you will serve other gods day and night, for I will grant you no favor. 
What's it all, what's this all about, right? Tell them, your forefathers did this. It's going back, generations. This is interesting. Not only God mentions the forefather, but he says, you're also doing it too. And you become, what does he say? You have done evil even more than your forefathers. This is quite interesting to what Moses said in the Torah about God visiting the sins to the third and fourth generation. Now, third and fourth generation, that would be great. That'd be great grandchildren, right? You know, you have your children, you have, you have a person, you have a man or woman, and you have children, and you have grandchildren, and you have great grandchildren, third or fourth generation. And it's quite interesting that somehow the, gene, the, the generations from the forefathers, let's say three or four generations early, to now where they are in Jeremiah's days, forsook the Lord. They kept forsaking the Lord. Each generation got progressively worse. And you know this is true in Christian society too. At one time in our nation, our great-grandfathers went to church. They were probably closer to being Christians. In fact, I could tell you that there were probably, a lot, there's a lot of people today my age that their grandparents were probably Christians, but their parents were not, and they themselves are totally not. How did that happen? Progressively, that generation did not pass on the gospel to their next generation. And you would say, well, my grandfather was a Christian and he went to church. Yeah, but somehow your dad went to church, but he was not a Christian. Hey, he's probably a good man. But then you are neither a good man, nor go to church, nor a Christian. Because the idea is that the next generation thinks they could be good without God. That's how the generation thinks. They may have good morals. They may have good... Uh, passing down of morality from grandparent to parent to children. Uh, maybe the dad is a good moral person. Don't go to church. He's not a Christian. And they, it's, it's not automatic that the next generation is going to be a Christian either. So if that doesn't even get passed to the grandchildren, guess what happens? The grandchildren don't become Christians. They're not morals, and they're not good. And they're very different than their grandparents. Now take it to one generation extra and say, now let's do great-grandchildren it becomes more and more diluted. Right? It happens in our nation. Our, our, you know, let's say people that were in World War I, great-grandparents or grandparents in World War I who came back from the war, who lived through difficulties. A lot of them became believers. A lot of them came back and didn't believe in God anymore because at that time there was such a confusion in our world about how, it, how God can allow such wars and, and these terrible things happening in our world. And then they have children, and those children were sort of skeptical about God. Maybe they, they went to church but didn't really care for being born again. But they were good moral people, right? They were good, good moral people. Then they had children. And those children didn't went to church, never heard the gospel because their parents didn't want to go to church either. And now those children have children. So now we get to the great-grandchildren, which is as far as I believe a person can influence. You know, I, I have to think of the fact that if the Lord tarries, I, I'm influencing my children. That's going to have an influence on my grandchildren. Right? And I don't know. I lived long enough to see great grandchildren, but that's as far as I could influence. Now, Roy and Carol, you have great, great grandchildren, right? It's about as, it's as far as you can influence. Now, man can influence his great grandchildren for good or for evil. It goes the other way, too. You could influence them for the gospel, you could influence them for evil. But at some point, that, gen that generation becomes diluted if they don't come to the Lord at some point in the middle. Now, thank God for those who maybe had great-grandparents that were believers, and they themselves became Christians now. And for the first time, remember, remember, they didn't get passed along. Maybe for the first time, it's like a, a fresh experience for kids to come to know the Lord because their parents didn't know the Lord or their grandparents didn't know the Lord, but maybe their great-grandparents were Christians, right? So a lot of people are coming to know the Lord now, praise God, that never had a Christian upbringing. It's brand new to them. Even though some were in the genealogy, some of them were Christians. It's interesting in our nation how it's, how it's coming about. But you could say the same thing is happening to us. It happened to Israel. That generation, third or fourth generation, they were worse than their forefathers. And that is absolutely true. Great-grandchildren, if the gospel doesn't get passed along, will do worse things than their great-grandparents. Why? Because society deteriorates and becomes more evil along the way. And remember, you know, goodness is not passed along through genealogy. You know, goodness is not passed along. Um, somebody might be good, but that goodness won't be passed on. What I mean by good is maybe a good moral person. 
But don't count on your children being moral without God. And that's what, that was a big mistake that a lot of societies made. They believed that you could be a good moral person. You could be conservative. You could be, and, and then expect your children to be the same way? No. Unless they know the gospel, it will not happen. It will not happen. Society will permeate them uh, more and more with sin. Because we're for fallen creation. We're a fallen creation. And, and the further we go without God, the further in line we go without God, the more and more sinful our generation will become. And that, uh, you know, I don't have to explain it to you guys. You have grandchildren, great-grandchildren. You know how difficult it is to win them back to the Lord because of society. And it's difficult to bring them to Christ because of the pool of society and the sinful behaviors that they themselves have. Now, let's continue, because that was just not the problem in Israel. It's a problem for us today. But there is a promise to the land. God is going to restore them. Verse 14, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when they will no longer say, As the Lord lives who brought for the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. God has a plan for the nation. The generation at this time in Jeremiah was going to go into exile. But God says, I'm going to visit you. Later on in Jeremiah, we're going to find out there's going to be 70 years, 7-0, 70 years until God brings them back. They're going to spend 70 years in exile. That was decreed. That's determined. But God said, it's not done yet. I will bring you back, and I'm going to restore you. And it's not going to be like when I brought you out of Egypt. It's not going to be known. I am not going to be known like the God who brought you out of Egypt. I'm going to be known as the God who brought you out of the north. That's where Babylon was. And not only that, we also know, we know from history now, and we have our Bibles open, that they did come back. Read Ezra, read Nehemiah, read the books, right? And Jesus did come. God sent his greatest gift. He sent his son. And they rejected him. And they didn't learn the lesson, and they were exiled again out of the land in 70 A.D. by the Romans. And this time, it wasn't 70 years that they were gone out of the land, 2,000 years out of the land. And yet, in every society in the world where there were Jews, they kept their identity. One of the miracles of modern history. No matter where you went, you went to China, you went to Africa, you went to South America, Jews kept the Passover, Jews kept their name, Jews kept their culture and identity, and now God says it's time to bring them back. And in 1948, guess what happened? He brought them back, and they've been around since 1948. They've been around for a while. And it's a great encouragement to God's people is to say the Lord is not done. Look what it says here. It says it's not going to be just as, uh, as the Lord got you out of the land of Egypt. It's going to be I got you from the land of the north and from all the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to their own land, which I gave to their fathers. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because it even says it's not just the north, but all the countries, um, which is a, a bit prophetic, isn't it? Because it's not just Babylon, but all the countries. It's almost a prophetic purposes here for God, for Israel, that they were going to be banished into, the, into all the nations of the world, which they were, but he's going to restore them. Verse 16, Behold, I'm going to send them many fishermen, declares the Lord. I will fish for them. Afterwards, I will send them from any hunters, and they will hunt them from every mountain and every hill and from the clefts of the rock. That's a weird one. God is going to send people to hunt them down so they can come back to the land. Um, quite interesting what happened to the Jewish people. What, what actually caused them to go back to the land? It was the threat. It was the threat, the military threat, the governmental threats, not only of the Holocaust, but other countries like Russia, that actually brought them back into Israel. They said, it's not safe for us. And by the way, they're even saying that today. In many Muslim countries, Jews are not safe. Even places like France, which I'm not ready to call them a Muslim country, but it's almost a Muslim country. France, Jewish French are heading to Israel. It's quite interesting what's happening in our world today. Uh, God's going to send hunters. God's going to send fishermen, and they're going to come out of the land, out of those countries, and they're going to go into the land. For my eyes are all on their ways. They're not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity concealed from my eyes. I will first doubly pay their iniquity for their sin because they have polluted my land, defiled my inheritance for the carcasses of their desolate idols and with their abominations. O oh Lord, my strength and my stronghold, says Jeremiah, in my refuge in the day of distress, to you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but falsehood. 
futility and things of no profit. Can a man make idols for himself? Yet they are not gods. Therefore, behold, I am going to make them known this time. I will make them know my power and might, and they will know that my name is the Lord. This is quite interesting here. Um, what is going to happen? The nation is going to be rebuilt. God is going to bring them back after 2,000 years, after, the, after what happened in Babylon. And, you know, it's interesting. God's going to do something in the future. He's going to bring the nations to himself. So this is, we're looking way down in this little passage here. We're looking way down in the corridor of history. We're looking at the time of Jesus ruling and reigning when nations will come. Like it says in Isaiah 2. From the ends of the earth they will come. And they're going to leave their gods, their idols. And they're going to know the name of the Lord. Well, don't hold your breath. It's not happening now, as it were. But one day they will come. Nations will come and know the Lord. But it has happened in a, in a, in a strange way, isn't it? It has happened already through the gospel. Nations, Gentiles have come to know the Lord, have left their gods, and have followed the God of Israel. Absolutely. And it will happen ultimately when Jesus comes. The nations of the world will set themselves to worship the only true God. It will be the Lord. And leave all their idolatry out of the way. And they would only worship the Lord. So this is going to happen. So it, it, what will happen is it will be the end. It will be at the end. Jeremiah is looking further ahead and saying, oh, there's a good place for Israel. There's a good place for Judah. There's a good place for the Jews. But it's going to happen in the future. Do you want this to happen, Jeremiah? Do you want this to happen, Israel? Right? The nation had a choice. They were in spiritual decline no doubt, in a very, very spiritual decline. And they could see that God was going to judge them, but they could also see that God was going to bless them eventually. It was going to bring them back. When? At the time when they regather back from, his, from the nations, God was going to bring them back and put them in the land, and then they will know the Lord, and they will bring other nations to him. Uh, we obviously haven't seen the end of this yet, and God has given them a choice. Let's go to chapter 17. Let's go to verse 5. Let's go to verse 5, because now we're dealing with the individual level, the individual level. So we know what's going to happen to the nation. The, the kingdom is going to suffer loss. They're going to exile. It's a very spiritual decline. But in the middle of it, God gives individuals hope, individuals hope. And uh, we're going to focus on this tonight more than anything, because uh, the, the, the third part is society. What is society going to do? And that's at the end of chapter 17. But in verse 5, it says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind, who trusts in man, and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. For he will be like a bush in the desert, and he will not see prosperity when he comes, but he will live in stony waste in the wilderness, and the land of salt without inhabitants, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord, for he will be like a deeply, like a, a tree planted by the water that extends its root by its streams and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor stop producing fruit, nor cease from yielding its fruit. There is a spiritual decline that is happening all around Jeremiah. In fact, it's like a downward spiral. Right? Like a downward spiral, right? And it's like Jeremiah zooms in, right, from the nation, talking about the kingdom and the land, and he zooms in on an individual. Not you, just Alyssa, but individuals, right? Zooms in on an individual and says, okay, what does God have for the individual? We know what God has for the nation. They're going to be exiled, but one day, when the Messiah comes, he will bring them back as a nation. Blessed is that man. Praise the Lord. Blessed is that nation. But what about you, God will say? What about you individuals who are in the midst of a spiritual decline? How are you going to make it through? How are you going to get through and prosper, even prosper during spiritual decline all around Jeremiah? How to make, how to make it through this time? And um, even if it's all around us and very bleak, I believe the men of God can prosper in spiritual times like this. The man or woman of God can prosper even when the nation is in decline, even when the church is under judgment, individual Christians will prosper, right? And the key was verse 13. Remember that? The key was verse 13. It's the fountain of living water. But what do we do with such a thing, right? 
um, give you a couple of things. Number one, when things are happening all around us that is very difficult, spiritual decline all around us, people are falling by the wayside spiritually. Remember this, there is no such thing as neutrality. What do you mean neutrality? God presents to us two pictures here. A man who is cursed, verse 5, right? Cursed is a man, and a man who is blessed, verse 7. A man who is blessed and a man who is cursed. Uh, any other options? Nope, I didn't read any other option, and you're right, there's no third option. Uh, Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. He didn't say three masters, or four masters, or five, right? Uh, he says there's, uh, there's two roads, one's broad, one's narrow, right? Uh, two destinations. There's two destinations in our, in our world. And Jeremiah is going to use the picture now of trees. Two trees. Two destinations. Two trees. Curses and blessings. Aren't people looking for a third option? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. People look for a third option because, look, um, and I've known about this. You know, you've known about this. You deal with this. In ministry, you deal with it. People look for a third option, meaning like, well, I don't want to go to hell, but I really don't want to be a committed Christian, so I sort of want to walk in the, in the middle, you know, this, this neutral aspect of it, right? This neutral aspect of it. Um, you know, I, I sort of want this insurance policy in my life that uh, I want to assure myself that not to go into eternal judgment, but I'm not interested in being different than the world. I want to avoid the curses, right, of God, but I also don't want to be, receive the blessings of God because the blessings of God makes you different. By the way, when you say blessed, it's not talking about material blessing. It's a state of blessing, right? Blessed is the man, ble like the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are you when they speak evil of you. Well, that's not a blessing, is it? You ever thought about that? <laughs> blessed are you when they speak evil of you? So they, they spoke to the prophets the same way, so they persecuted the prophets the same way. Well, how's that a blessing? It's not talking about material possession or something. If it's a state of blessing, it's, a, it's, it's the beatitude speaking of a man who has determined his life to follow the Lord and committed his way to the Lord. Therefore, whatever happens in his life is because God has put him in that situation. And though he's able to accept it, right? Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Well, nobody wants to die, but what's the alternative? To be with the Lord, right? So blessed is that man. Blessed are the poor in spirit. All these blessings in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, there's a lot of blessings, right? It starts with the blessing. It ends with the blessing. But it's a state of blessing. It's a, it's a condition. It's not how much money you have. It's the condition in a relationship with God. It's a state of blessing, not a material possession. So I hope you understand that. So people go, I, I just want the third option. There's not such thing as a third option. The Catholic Church made up this idea about a third option called limbo, right? It's called purgatory. It doesn't exist in the Bible, but it's that same idea, looking for a third option. Well, not good enough to go to heaven, not bad enough to go to hell, so there's sort of a middle road, non-existent. Um, you're either under God's curse, it says here in the Bible, or under God's blessing. Now, the choice is it's going to be interesting. The choice is ours, right? And um, God wants us to, you know, God wants us to be a flourishing tree, as it were. Uh, I was reading this story, and it's kind of interesting. In Switzerland, if you drive through Switzerland, it's kind of an interesting thing. You can go through Switzerland. There's like little signs along the road that says, you know, you are entering into the watershed. And it's like, watershed? What is that? Well, as you go through, uh, I wish I brought a map. Um, when it rains... It's like a land. It's like a, a demarcation line. When it rains in Switzerland, uh, you can go. The, the water can go either way. When it rains, it either goes into the Rhine. And if you guys know your geography, that's a river, Rhine. And that Rhine goes into the North Sea. It flows into the North Sea. And there's another uh, another river called the Rhone. All right, sorry about you know Switzerland geography. It's not like you came to church for that reason. But you know there's a, a river called Rhone, and that Rhone leads into the Mediterranean Sea. So when it rains in Switzerland, you know, this is at least in parts of Switzerland, this happens. When it rains in Switzerland, no water ends up in the same place. No amount of water, no two drops of water are alike. No two drops of water ends up in the same place. One will go into the Rhine and North Sea. One will go into the Rhone, into the Mediterranean Sea. So no matter what, two, you know, same, same, same source of water will end up in two different places. And so this is the same thing for us. Only two possibilities that that water can go. There's only two possibilities for people to go. God's curse that will eventually lead to the Savior saying to that individual, depart from me, I never knew you. Or God's blessing where the Savior would say, 
welcome into the kingdom of my Father, prepare for the foundation of the world, so that you would be ruling and reigning with Christ. Two destinations, two ways it's going to go. And so we're either moving toward God or away from God. We're either being the cursed man or the blessed man. Right? We're either trusting in God or trusting in men. And there is no middle ground. There's no middle ground in our destiny, and therefore there's no middle ground in our spiritual life today. Make that absolutely clear. Before we find out how to prosper and how to deal with spiritual decline, know this, that there is only two destinies after we die. And therefore, there's only two, destined, two spiritual lives today. You either have the life of the Spirit in Christ or the life of a cursed man who's away from Christ. So that's, that's the first part. No neutrality. Secondly, can you tell who is who? Can you tell who is who? Meaning, can you tell who is the cursed man? And can you tell who is the blessed man? Well, we're going to have to read a little bit, right? Um, now, only God knows infallibly. Only God knows exactly and exactly right. He gets it always right. But overall, I believe you can know. I believe you can know who is who. Who is under God's curse and who is under God's blessing. I believe you can. Now, ultimately, God is infallible. He knows ultimately and always will get it right. doesn't mean we will always get it right. It just means that we can overall tell the direction in a person's life. My direction, your direction. You can know who's who. Who is the cursed man and who is the blessed man. Let's read verse 5 again. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind. He will be like uh, whose flesh is his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the desert. The, uh, and he'll be like this, uh, he'll actually be in stony wastelands in the land of the salt. What that means is quite interesting. There it is. It's actually a picture of one in the Middle East. Yeah, this is a tree in the Middle East. And you kind of see there, you can kind of see that uh, not a lot of life going on in that tree. It's a wilderness. And they have these little shrubs near the Dead Sea. This is what it's talking about, the, the land of salt, right? And uh, they're struggling to survive. You see these little bushes in the area? And they're struggling to survive. There's no water in one bad season, and they're gone. They probably won't be there next year. And uh, that is a man who trusts in man, right? That is a man who trusts in man. They are stunt. They are dwarf. They are absolutely nothing. And they're in the middle of a drought, and it'll die. That's what a, 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 a tree in this environment, they don't, will, never, will never amount to anything. In fact, it even makes a case, when you read it, there is no fruit. Notice, there is no fruit. It grows a little bit. Maybe it's good for something at one time. But it sees no rain. It sees no growth. And it sees no fruit. Everybody clear with that? All right. You guys can see that, right? There's no, no rain, no fruit, no growth. Nothing that we would desire uh, in terms of this shrub, this man, the representation of a man who doesn't trust the Lord, actually trusts man. They trust something, but they trust man. Verse 7, however, blessed is the man who do, who does, he trusts the Lord. He whose trust is the Lord, right? He will be, as a word, he'll be like a tree planted by the water, just like uh, Psalm 1. And that extends its roots by its streams and will not fear when the heat comes. So you see these trees out in, the, in Israel. This is one. Uh, they're planted by the rivers. And you see something unique about these trees. It's like they extend. They extend further and further out into the water. You can see it. Um, their roots become bigger. Their roots become longer. Their roots become Almost they stretch out toward the water. It's like they're looking for the water, and they dig deep to get the water. Uh, even in drought, they actually survive. And they are, by the river, drawing this water constantly, constantly. And that is the picture of a man who trusts in the Lord. Remember, remember verse 13, the fountain of living water? They're drawing deep into the water. Why? Those who trust the Lord. Now, a human eye can see the difference. Can you see the difference between this and this, I mean, it's quite telling, isn't it? I don't have to tell you which one you want to be, right? But a shrub, a shrub or a luscious tree, and the big difference is the fountain of living water, verse 13. One is drawing from the water and producing fruit. The other one's dried, and there's no contact with the water. 
There's no contact with the water at all. So when we look at a man, we look at the fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? Galatians 5. Galatians 5. You can turn to it if you want. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. But the fruit of the Spirit, nine, or one fruit, nine flavors. One fruit, nine flavors. Remember, the fruit, singular, of the Spirit. And, um, and, the, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, it says in Galatians 5. Love. Well, how do we demonstrate love? Love for who? Each other? Okay, yeah, love for the Lord, love for the cross, love for the church, right? Love for fellowship, love for ministry and serving Christ, love for the lost. No doubt, love covers a lot of things in there, right? But there's fruit of the Spirit is love. Remember, one fruit, nine flavors. What's the next flavor? Joy. And what's the next flavor after that? Peace. What's the next flavor? Patience or long suffering, right? Suffer long, putting up with things, right? How are we doing with that? So far, so good? You got four, love, joy, you got joy, you have peace, right? How about the next one? Kindness, otherwise known as gentleness. How about the next one? Goodness, plain goodness. It's plain goodness in people's lives. What's the next one? Faithfulness. I mean, staying with it, right? Staying with it. It's staying with the Lord, staying with your faith. What's the next one? Yeah, meekness, right? The idea of meekness is under, uh, to be under restraint. You know, your emotions are under restraint. That You could react, you could attack, you could go after somebody that went after you. But meekness, and then, of course, self-control. Overall self-control, right? The character of Christ. This is the character of Christ that needs to be there. All right, you think of a person, you think of a person and you say, well, he professes to be Christian, right? Uh, there's profession there, but is the character of Christ increasingly there, consistently being reproduced in that person, right? Um, that's why we could tell. That's how we can tell. Is the character of Christ, which is the fruit of the Spirit, by the way, is the divine character of Christ. Uh, you think of Christ, right? You think of is Christ love? Is Christ joy? Is he peace? Is he long-suffering? Is he gentle? Is he faithful? Is he good? Is he meek? Is he, does he have self-control? All those other things are true. It's the, it's the divine character of Christ. And that is being built up in the believer by the Holy Spirit, being produced in us. And evidence of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit, starting with love. Nine flavors, right? Same, same fruit, nine flavors. And it's the character of Christ, is that character consistently being brought in your life through the Holy Spirit? Is there evidence in your life? Is there tangible proof that the roots, go back to the roots, have contact with the living water? That's how a man is to be represented, how a, a man who trusts the Lord represents, right? Professions, all day long. People profess a lot of things. But is there contact with the living water? Is there consistent an increasingly growth of the reproduction of the character of Christ in your life. That's the, that's the evidence, right? Um, do they love the Lord? Well, it's easy to say, I love the Lord. But what's the test? Do you love the person next to you? That's the test. John says, it's easy to say, I love God, right? But he who says, I love God and does not love his brother, he lies. He lies. That's a test. Everybody goes, I love God. He's awesome. He's lovable. He is. Of course he is. Who wouldn't love God? Well, unless you're not thinking right, right? He's lovable. What's not to love about God? There's not much to love about me. But yet the scripture says, as you love the Lord, demonstrate that love toward one another. And so does that person love the Lord? Does that person love his brother? His, his Christian friends, uh, Christian brothers and sisters, like family, because that's what it's become. A fellowship, right? They love fellowship. They need it. They are faithful. They have joy. They have peace. They have goodness. They have temperance. They have meekness. And that becomes more and more evident in their lives each and every day, each and every year. Notice I didn't use the word perfection. Notice I even used the word, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they don't sin anymore. We're talking about a progress of the fruit of the spirit being built up in that person. 
Uh, now, some may say that they're Christians, right? Some may say that they're Christians, or they may have been Christians before, but there's no evidence. There's no fruit. There's no character of Christ. There's no contact with the living water. There's no roots in that living water. What muddy, so what do you have to say? Can you tell who is who? Can you tell who is who? And the answer is, yeah, you can tell. You can tell who is who. Now, I've never told you, God is the only one who's infallible. God is the only one that gets 100% right all the time. But the evidence is there. Now, can you tell who is who? The Christian has two parts, by the way. Every Christian has two parts. It has his believing part, and it has his behaving part. Right? Belief and behavior. Both start with the B, so it's easy to remember, right? Belief and behavior. And you cannot say, looking at a crowd like here or outside, and you cannot say with 100% surety by looking at someone's face, oh, yeah, I know there's belief there. You can't. It's like what James says. You can't see each other's faces, right? You can't see each other's faces. Uh, James makes that clear. But we can see the behavior. That can be seen. That can be seen. And if there's fruit of the Spirit, right? And there's no neutrality with God, right? Talk about no neutrality. Those who bear the fruit can bear it because of the blessing of God. If that person has contact with the water, he's the blessed man who trusts the Lord, then there will be evidence. Absolutely will be evidence. Just as much as there's evidence between this and this. It's absolutely true. Now, let's look at another reason. Third reason. Can you know the reason for their differences? Can you know the reason for their differences? Meaning that um, in the person, can you know the reason for the difference between the man who is cursed and the man who is blessed? Well, verse 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Cursed is the man who trusts in man whose flesh is his strength. His heart departs from the Lord. His heart turns away from the Lord. Um, that man cannot cope with what's going on in life. Uh, but the one who trusts the Lord, he carries on because he has a deep source of water. That's the, that's the biggest key. When a crisis comes, it sorts out. It always sorts it out. Who's trusting God and who's trusting men? It's always, it's always a test, right? And that's we're experiencing something in our, in our world today. Who's really trusting God? Who's really trusting men? And those, who, those tough times, the man of God will shine. Make no doubt about it. You know, the economic experts have said to us in the last year, oh, all these economic problems, it's just transitory. Not going to matter. We're just going to do it temporarily. And, um, you know, 2019 came, 2020 came, 2021 came, and now it's almost gone, and 22 comes. And the Federal Reserve saying, well, you know, it might be a little bit longer than we thought. And actually, this little transitory thing, it might last for years. In fact, it might be even be after the next election. And people are beginning to wonder, oh, wait a minute, what's up with this cycle? You know, it's supposed to be a cycle. Now it's like a long cycle now. It's not going to be, it might be 10, 12 years before they get even back to the economic means that they had prior to 2020. And people are going, oh, no. And people begin to trust in man or trust the Lord. So it's a big test. But it's the man who trusts the Lord, right? Verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts the Lord. It's like asking a question. Here, help. Where can I get help? Ask the question, who can help me? The man who trusts in himself, right? The man who trusts in himself is they see their sin. The man who trusts in men or the trust in themselves, they see their sin and they automatically say, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this. I'm going to fix it. So how does man fix it? So man sees, sees, sins, sees sin in himself and he's trusting in man, right? He's trusting in himself. How's he going to fix it? What do you guys know? What do you guys think about that? When a man trusts in himself and he sees that sin is within him, how is he going to get it done? How is he going to fix that problem? Well, he's trusts in men. Remember, he trusts in men. Right. Well, he's going to go to church. I'm going to go to church and I am going to uh, talk to the pastor. And he's, uh, he's going to help me. He's going to help me. I, I know, I know, because he's a good guy. And he's going to help me. He's going to help me with my sin. Now, I'm not saying don't talk to people, but I'm saying, where do you run to when you need help? Maybe get help from the church. Maybe get help from religious duties. 
maybe get help from the flesh. That's my point. They will go and get help from the flesh. Now, another person needs help. He's convinced that his sins are ever before him, and he needs to trust in someone. That blessed man trusts in the Lord. Where is he going to go to? He's going to go to the Lord. He's going to go get the Savior. And, you know, he's going to go to the Lord who sent the Savior. The Lord is the Savior. And he's the one that rose again and lives forevermore to make intercession for us. He's the one that intercedes for us and is coming again. He is the fountain of living water. The point is, where do you get your help from? My help comes from the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. Absolutely. It's the Lord first. doesn't mean you don't talk to people. It's not the point here. The point is, people automatically turn to someone. Right? When you're in a crisis, what do you do? You make that call. <laughs> call the church. Call the so-and-so. Whatever, right? Or do we pray? Remember King, uh, King Asa? Remember King Asa? Remember King Asa? No, King Asa. All right. King Asa was a good king, godly king. But what happened to him? He got a terrible disease. What did he do? Can I get a doctor, please? Somebody get a doctor. Get a doctor. He called the doctor. He got a doctor to come. And the doctor was trying to help him. And the Lord says, Asa... Why didn't you come to me? You're the king. You're the representative of the Messiah. You're the representative of King David. Why didn't you come to me? You know what? He didn't. He didn't. And the Lord says, Asa, because you didn't trust the Lord, you're not going to get well. You're not going to get well. Now, why is it so harsh on King Asa? That sounds terrible, isn't it? At least he got some help, but why is the Lord so harsh? Remember, it's not... It's, he is the king. He is the spiritual leader of the nation. And he is to lead people to trust the Lord, not trust in man. I mean, what can doctors do? By the way, doctors are just as human as I am, right? just as human as you are. And what does he can do? Well, the only thing a doctor can do, and I have doctor friends, they can prescribe, <laughs> and they can prescribe, and they can bandage you, but they cannot heal you. That's it. And you practice medicine. You know that, right? They can bandage you and they can prescribe. But only the Lord can heal, right? That doctor is a man like yourself. And if you find help in doctors only and not the Lord of Scripture, then we're trusting in man. Now, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, by the way. Please do not go around and say, oh, he says not to go to the doctor. Make it clear. We ought to go. And the Bible makes it clear that medicine is it's good. It's okay to take it. But who do we call first? We call him the Lord, right? Because if you think, oh, the doctor's going to get me well, he's just a man like you. He's probably more confused because he's seen 100,000 cases like that. And he doesn't know what to do. Now, let's go to the next one. Don't fool yourself about which kind of man you are. Why? Look at verse 9. The heart is deceitful and desperately sick more than anything else. Who could understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind to give each one according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Don't fool yourself about saying, oh, I know who I am. I'm the man who trusts the Lord. Thanks, Pastor. You clarify that. Right? I know who I am. How dare you think I'm the other guy, Pastor? You know, I could say it quickly without even thinking about it. I'm not that, I'm not that shrub you know, by, the, by the desert. I trust the Lord. Wait a minute. Hold on. Why is this verse here about the heart? Why is this verse here about don't deceive yourself? People could automatically think, I'm all right. Hey, I'm here, am I? I could be doing something else. The heart is deceitful. Don't fool yourself. P listen to this. People that Paul the Apostle witnessed to and discipled were told, sit down and examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Anyone here been discipled by Paul the Apostle? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, boy. I can't wait for that one. Right? Uh, I haven't. I've discipled people, but I'm nowhere close to Paul the Apostle. I don't know anybody here been discipled Paul the Apostle. Wait a minute. You're telling me that people that were discipled by Paul the Apostle were told to sit down, be quiet, and examine yourself if you're in the faith. I mean, don't you think those guys were probably pretty right on? I mean, Paul the Apostle was there. He, yeah, he had the power of God. He wrote Scripture. And he discipled you. I mean, if somebody was here, discipled by the Apostle Paul, wouldn't you make them the pastor right away? I'd be like, dude, get up there and tell us something. Yeah, right? You would be like, oh, can I go visit you? Can I hang out with you? Why do you think that? Because, hey, they must know something that maybe nobody else knows. He's 
Disciple by Paul the Apostle. That person, Paul says, sit down, be quiet, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Now, how much more us? How much more I? How much more us to say, I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to deceive myself. I want to know if I'm really drawing from that water. I don't want to assume, and I don't want to think just because I'm here at CCOD that I am that wonderful, luscious tree. I want to know if I'm that luscious tree. I want to see if my fruit's there. Um, some people can be deceived into that, into that place and be so self-deceived, Jesus said, that one day they will show up and they'll say to Jesus, we've done all these things. And then the Lord's going to say what? Yeah, depart from me. I never knew you. You who practice wickedness, lawlessness. Now you imagine, those people were not going around saying like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to make it. They went up to the Lord with confidence saying, Lord, I am ready. I'm in. Ready? Oh, you, you don't know me? Practice wickedness? Yeah. What kind of self-deception is that? That's deep, isn't it? That even the Lord had to wake him out of that deception and says, you're not mine. You've done miracles. You've done all these things. Great. They must have helped someone. But there's no evidence that that was for me. I never knew you. That's what we have to be careful about being self-deceived. Uh, what kind of a man do we want to be? Of course we want to be like that, like that man who trusts the Lord. But here Jeremiah brings up the, the, the heart because who could understand it? Only the Lord. Only the Lord can show us our motives. Only the, we can get so mixed up right in our thinking. right? But only the Lord can show us. How does the Lord show us? Without this, your heart can be all, well, I'm a Christian. Sure I am. Well, how do you know? I just feel it. I just feel it's God. I just feel it's the Lord. Wait a minute. Do you have any evidence of that? Because <laughs> the scripture actually says that you're actually quite different than the scriptures, right? That's the point. It's the scripture who shines that light in our hearts and say, huh, don't forget who you are. It's like the man who looks in the mirror and forgets what he saw. That's what James says. Don't forget what you saw. Don't forget what you are. Now, the mind of a man, and by this time, we're almost done, uh, people can become so bored that they begin to think about everything else but spiritual things. And a man can, as the word of God goes out and the searchlight of God's word goes out into that person's heart, that person's heart can say, I don't want to think about this. I want to think about something else. Ah, what do men think about when they don't want to think about spiritual things? What do they think about the most? Material things. That's natural, isn't it? When we don't want to listen to what the Holy Spirit's trying to show us through the scriptures. You ever been there? Well, you, I don't want to hear it. And people get like this. I don't want to hear I don't want to, I don't want to hear this stuff about conviction. I'd rather think about what I'm going to do tomorrow or think about my investments or think about all these other things, right? And look at verse, uh, verse 11. As a partridge... This is funny. This is actually pretty funny. As a partridge that hatches eggs which is, has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune but unjustly in the midst of his day will forsake him, and in the end he will be a fool. When God's word is searching our hearts, right, um, people can switch it off. Even genuine believers can switch it off, by the way. And where does the mind go? It goes to materialism. And this is the perfect example of this. So this is in the Middle East. You got to think Middle East. You got to think Judaism or, or being a Jew at the time. They have these partridge, not the partridge in a pear tree like we're going to sing soon. right? It's, it's, it's actually a bird in the Middle East. You know what, they, what it does? It actually um, looks around for eggs, and he steals them from other birds, and he brings them to his nest. And they're cold, and so he lays on the eggs and hatches them. Now, what happens sometimes is sometimes those eggs don't hatch. And sometimes the eggs do hatch, and it's another bird. And once it grows, it, it flees the nest. At the end, what does this, the partridge have at the end in that nest? A pear tree. <laughs> yeah, a pear tree. <laughs> a big zero. A big zero. So he's done. He accumulated all this stuff. He put all his material goods in his egg basket, right? We think about that in the, you know. Don't we say that sometimes? We wonder how much, you have, how much is in that egg basket, right? How much is in that nest? Um, your, 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 what do they call it? The golden, you know, my basket, yeah, and your golden eggs or whatever they call it, right? Your 401k, whatever that thing is, right? Uh, and people look at it and they say, oh, I have so much. I have so this, I have that. And uh, guess what? At the end, uh, there will be a poor. 
they'll be a poor person because when you think about, if your mind goes into material things, away from spiritual things, guess what they'll eventually have? You won't have those material things. You think about your material things so much, in 50 years, you're not going to have them. Well, most of us, right? So I just, you know, uh, for me. In 50 years, I'm not going to have it. So why do I care? Why does my mind go there? Why does my mind automatically go there instead of thinking about the things that are going to be eternal, right? In the end, I'm not going to have those material things that I'm thinking about. And this is God's, God's warning to this person or to the, to the man who doesn't trust the Lord is the fact that the Bible calls him a fool. Now, Jesus says, don't, uh, well, put it this way. The Bible does not make fun of people by calling them fools. It's not making fun of their mental capacity. A fool in the Bible is somebody who is morally depraved, who's morally wrong, who's morally deficient. Not mentally deficient, morally deficient. That's a fool. Jesus says, don't, people, don't call people fools mentally deficient. But then Jesus turned around and told that man who built barns and, bar, and bigger barns and bigger barns, he says, you fool, tonight you'll, your soul will be required of you. Wait a minute, Jesus, you told us not to call people fools. Yeah, mentally, no. But spiritually and morally bankrupt, that is a fool, according to the Bible, because they're hedging their bets that material things are going to save them. But not realizing that at some point, you will have no material things. And the only thing you'll have are spiritual things. There'll be an eternal life that you will go into. And if you switch your mind off now from spiritual things to material things, guess what? You won't even have the eternal life that you are actually avoiding. You won't even, you, you'll enter into an eternal life, but it won't be eternal life with Christ. And that's the sad part about it is people don't think about their end, don't think about the reality where they're going and they have to deal with the next world. They don't want to think about it, but that's where they're going. And this is Jeremiah's point. The fool or the man who doesn't trust the Lord actually thinks about material things and it becomes like that partridge. Just eggs, 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 and then they all fly away. And then they look and they go like, what do I have? Nothing. You have accumulated absolutely zero. Let's finish this. Because now we're going to look at the example of Jeremiah. Last few verses, verse 12. A glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away, those who turn away on earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water, even the Lord. Where does Jeremiah look to? He looks to the Lord. He looks to his throne. He looks to his sanctuary. Now, it's kind of interesting because he looks to the throne. He looks as a sanctuary, as a refuge. That's what a sanctuary is, a refuge. And it's interesting because, you know, isn't the throne where the, the Lord judges? Is his throne the place where judgment and justice come from? Why would a sinner look for the throne of judgment? Because that throne of judgment, that same God who issues judgment issues also mercy. And that throne has now, for the sinner, has become a refuge. That's what a sanctuary has become, a refuge. A place of judgment has become a refuge. You can hide yourself in God. And Jeremiah calls God the hope of Israel. Notice verse 13. Oh, the hope of Israel. That's his favorite term for God. Jeremiah loves to call God his hope. More than anything, more than anything for ourselves is to be concerned for the things of the Lord to satisfy Christ, to bring him to a place of worship, right? That, that, is, that was Jeremiah's point. It's, it's not to forsake the Lord, to really seek after God in the midst of all this decline. And then the Lord replies. Look what it says. All who forsake you, uh, those who turn away from the earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living water. Those who depart, right? Those who turn away will suffer loss. They have forsaken the Lord. Um, you know, they will be written down on the earth. I've been, I've been to, you've been to the beach. I've been to a couple of beaches in different places. And, and the funny thing is, I have little kids, right? So when they were little, we wrote our names everywhere, right? So I've written names. I don't know how many beaches we've been to, but I've written a lot of names in a lot of places. You will never find them. You will never find those names. You know why? They're gone. Yeah, there's no, it's It's sand. You've written their names. That's like the person who actually forgets the Lord. You'll never find them again. You'll never find them again. Now, the wicked is actually, in this case, this is the comparison to the wicked here. Um, you cannot remember them. Remember, the wicked will not cease to exist, but they just won't be found anymore. 
that won't be seen. There's no permanency with the wicked, with those who don't trust the Lord. Um, heaven and the new heaven and the new earth has no place for them. Why? Because the roots never went to the living water. Their roots never enjoyed Christ. Those who don't trust the Lord, who trust only in man, have no contact with the living water. That's the, that's the key part. Now look at Jeremiah's wonderful prayer. Verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I'll be healed. Save me, and I'll be saved, for you are my praise. Look, they keep saying to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. But as for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd after you, nor have I longed for the woeful day, for you yourself know that the utterance of my lips was in your presence. Don't be a terror to me. You are my refuge in the day of disaster. Let those who persecute me be put to shame. But as for me, let me not be put to shame. Let them be dismayed. Let me not be dismayed. Bring on, day, bring on them a day of disaster. Crush them with twofold destruction. And people wonder, what is Jeremiah doing? What is he praying? God responds to his prayer. Jeremiah prays. He prays hard. He, he, he calls on the Lord. By the way, uh, this idea of the Lord knowing him, it's, it's some, similar to Psalm 139. If you've ever read Psalm 139, it's a beautiful psalm. Lord, you have searched me and known me. And this prayer of Jeremiah puzzles people. Maybe it puzzles you. Because he literally is praying for God's will to be done on those who don't trust the Lord and for God to judge them. And people have a hard time with that prayer because they said, oh, should we pray like that? Now, this is, uh, this is called imprecatory psalms or imprecatory prayers. You ever heard those terms, imprecatory? And what it means is basically praying to God to deal with the enemies. How do you deal with them? Is, is he praying against people? Well, Jeremiah, remember last time we talked about Jeremiah taking God's side or man's side? And he was on the man's side of things, and God kept correcting him. Jeremiah, you don't understand what they've done. You don't understand what's going on. And he finally tells him, Jeremiah, you need to see it from my perspective. I'm going to judge them. I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to save them. But individuals who recognize my word, they will be saved. But otherwise, uh, the nation is going to go their way. Now Jeremiah takes God's side. He says, you know what, Lord? This is what's going on. I have not rejoiced. Look at verse 16. I have not longed for the woeful day. I'm not taking vengeance on them. I've only said your word. I have not shied away from being a, a shepherd to them. I haven't longed for the woeful day, meaning I, I haven't desired for them to be destroyed. Lord, the only thing I've done is preach your word. And when we preach your word, we recognize one thing. When you look at it from God's perspective, this is what you find. You find that God has enemies. I don't know about you, but I don't know if you realize that. Hopefully it doesn't come as a shock. God has enemies. There are people that hate God. There are people that don't want God. There are people that would, if God were to show up, they'll try to destroy him. They would nail him to a cross again if he came. Well, in, 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 in Revelation, actually, he does come, and they try to make war against him. So you see, mankind's still bent on destroying God. And so when you see it from man's, man's perspective, you can say, oh, man, we shouldn't pray like this. This is terrible. See, from God's perspective, say, God, you have enemies. God, I am not going to take vengeance. And this is, this is the part of the prayer that Jeremiah is very careful about, right? Um, he's being honest. Lord, I, I don't want to take vengeance on them. Why? Because vengeance is yours. And Lord, and when I preach your word, I preach because this is going to happen. Judgment is going to come on the enemies of God, on those who don't trust the Lord, those who went against it. Right? Uh, I don't want them to go in that, in that way, but Lord, I'm just preaching your word. In fact, you can look at it this way. I talk about hell sometimes, you know, when we preach about hell. I don't say it because I, I don't like people. People go, oh, man, you're talking about hell. I don't do it because I hate people. I dangle them over hell and, and threaten them. I don't do that at all. I don't want them to go to hell. In fact, I'm, I'm scared of hell too for myself. I don't want to be lost. I preach it because I know it's a terrible destiny. And to warn people about it is the best thing you can do because people don't believe in it anymore. But the Lord is the one who told us to preach that, didn't he? Same for Jeremiah. It's the Lord who told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, go tell them that this is going to happen. 
It's the Lord is the same one who told us, go and tell them. And when you deal with them, run into the sanctuary. Take refuge in it. Why? Because this is the place where you're going to hide at a critical time. Finish with this. Jeremiah, he tells the Lord everything in his heart. Notice that incredible honesty about Jeremiah. Hey, he's more honest than I could ever imagine. He tells the Lord everything that is in his heart at that moment. This, my friend, is the sign, true sign, of a man who trusts the Lord. He has, it's a great feature of Jeremiah. This is, this is one of the greatest things about Jeremiah that you'll find. It's of a man who weeps constantly for people. He weeps, he prays, and he has a constant, conscious communication with God. That is trusting God. He reveals his heart to the Lord. He says, Lord, search me and know me. I have not shied away from your word. I have told them. They have hated me. They have come against me. I could see now from your perspective, God, that they hate you. So, Lord, you judge them according to your ways. As for me, I'm going to run into your sanctuary. I'm going to take refuge in you. And that is constant living communication with the living God. And I love that about Jeremiah. That is a man who is trusting the Lord. And so I ask myself, do I talk to the Lord like that? And I ask you that today. Do you talk to the Lord like that? That constant, weeping, living communication with God for others, for what he told you to do. Do we, do I, do you? You know, what to do when things like this happen in our world? Spiritual decline, which has been in existing in our nation for a few years now, but especially the last few years. Will you be able to survive? Only if you make the Lord your trust. Only if you're that man like the tree, constant contact with the living water, with the, with the water that comes from the fountain of living water. Only by touching that, only by immersing ourselves in that, which comes through his word, is how we're going to make it. You going to survive it? Yeah. You even going to prosper in it, just like Jeremiah. He didn't partake of the decline. He actually grew in such a way that he was able to write these amazing words. Oh, blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water. It extends its roots by a water and will not fear when the heat comes. Persecution will come, will not fear it. It leaves will be green, it won't wither. It will not be anxious in a year of drought when there's spiritual decline. There's not going to be anxiety. And you will always be producing the fruit of the Spirit. Why? Because you trust Him. How do we trust Him? Living, constant, deep communication and in touch with the fountain of living water. Stay close. Draw those roots close to the water. Don't trust in men. That's the exercise, right? Not to trust in men. Don't make the flesh your strength but to trust the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the example of Jeremiah. When it was time for the spiritual decline in the nation, he looked to you. He looked to you as the only source of hope, life, and peace. It wasn't easy. Boy, this chapter was, these two chapters were not easy. But Lord, they were great encouragement for us. A man who trusts in God, a man who loves God, a man whose leaf never withers, whose fruit is always yielding. Lord, make that be our calling and our real life experience for us, that the character of Christ will be built up in us constantly, exceedingly, abundantly, with growth, with fruit, and Lord, and that we can actually touch other people's lives. So they will do the same. Lord, help us to examine our hearts. Help us to know us inside us, Lord. Who can know the heart? Only you. But you can reveal it. You can show us where we're wrong. You can show us where we lack. And I pray, Lord God, we will listen. 
that we would not wander off in our mind about things that are materially because things have become maybe too difficult and minister too difficult in the spiritual life and that we wander off into material things which ultimately we won't have in the future. So Lord, keep our mind on you. Keep our focus on you. Keep our thoughts directed toward glorifying Christ and building up the body of believers. That is a man who trusts the Lord, even in spiritual decline. 